You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. The fastest clothing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. Today we are in Ponte di Legno. How much of a relief is that? Luca, you said it's been a hard start to the relief. I mean, you can imagine how, you can see how happy we are and it's been a really hard start of the season and the classics didn't went as we want and we know Giro was very important for us and uh, by the way, now with this, uh, with this victory, is a, a big relief. And how far can Giulio go? I mean, he's looked like one of the best climbers in this race. I truly believe he's really a good, good climber. Um, as he is, I think he's not a guy for, uh, for the GC. Uh, will always be someone really focusing on the kind of, uh, of uh, pure climbing. But I think his potential he was there. I mean, he won very young, uh, many races as amateur and then race already as a pro. Uh, and then we would like to have him to make a step. And I think he, he already make it. And I believe he can be, can be a good rider on, on, uh, on a certain race. Who was that, Daniel? That sounded like your former coach. Yeah, it was actually. He is my former coach. Uh, Luca Guercilena from Trek Segafredo, team manager, celebrating Giulio Ciccone's win. Um, oh, that's the second time I've lost my fork. I'm trying to eat risotto. There are no the cats tonight, but podcasting. we are trying to eat. We're, and, we're yeah. in Lombardy, so you have, to, you have to eat risotto while podcasting. Um, yes, Trek Segafredo, it's not been a great season for them, has it? It's been tough. And, and Ciccone got a, a deserved win today. Um, and um, a very important one, if you're an Italian climber, um, to win, having scaled the Mortarello in first position, first, Rich? first position, and homing in on the King of the Mountains With title the Mountains as well. Jersey, that's pretty special. Absolutely, and you and I, Daniel, are joined tonight by Brian Nygaard, second appearance, Brian of the Giro, by popular request. I'm very honoured. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, you were you joined Daniel when Daniel was flying solo. I know, uh, he doesn't even uh, need an introduction now. I, no, I did it's a Brian Nygaard. Introduction. I went through his whole CV. Half of it was time. wrong. If you want to know who Brian is, uh, we're referring you to the previous episode. No, it's just wine lover. Well, well wine lover and art collector. Well, Brian when I Nygaard. yeah, when I appeared and cycling here, clothing producer, I, I mind couldn't you. help but notice that Sorry. he was holding his glass of wine by the stem, swilling it gently around and having a, a sniff. Yeah. So there's the mark of a real Richard. connoisseur. It's absolute plonk. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the wines from this we're drinking region. A, uh, well, you can uh, still know, look like you know what you're doing. Anyway, we're drinking, we're drinking are, you are you chewing gum? <laughs> Good stage, chaps. We're Good stage. No, let's wet talk about wine wet first. stage. We're drinking a Rosso della Val Camonica. It's a Marzemino. Um, it's not great, is it, Brian? A bit acidic. Um, this region's more known for its witches. I'm obsessed with the witches of this region. Um, we had some delicious wine. wine last night, Daniel. We did. We had uh, Francia Corta. We spoke a lot about Francia Corta uh, last year, but the sparkling version is less well known for its, um, well, what they call... Fermo. Fermi. Yeah, Vini Fermi, like flat wine, basically. Um, but we had a very good one last night. And it went very well with the fresh fish straight out of the lake. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not good with uh, freshwater fish. No? no. And I, I had a house for a while in Como, and I actually never, in that 10-year period, ever had any lake fish. Well, mine last night was absolutely delicious in a beautiful hotel with stunning views. We talked about that a bit last night, um, but it was it was good for the soul, I think. And we woke up and it was quite overcast, quite quite grey, um, but the weather just deteriorated as the day went on, as the stage went on, and as they climbed the Mortarolo, it was, you know, there'll be some great pictures from today. I'm sure there were riders with all sorts of problems getting rainwear on over the top, and it was funny, you know, some of the riders who were in race winning or positions or chasing hard struggled to get rain wear on which might be a factor over the the next few days um i was thinking back to bobby julich in the 1998 tour remember when he went off the road into camper van yeah and i was thinking you're probably nodding now um, i was thinking about jan ulrich who kind of almost lost that tour same when day Pantani was yeah. attacking and he didn't get his uh, rain jacket on well he maybe lost that tour because he couldn't get his rain jacket on and yeah there was uh, some riders were quite you know, okay at, at the finish, and other riders were in almost a hypothermic state. Roglic came in today in a sort of skin suit type affair, and uh, the Slovenian journalists here were very, were very concerned that he'd got cold. And um, so much so that the Slovenian TV crew that's here asked Adi Engels, "Will he start tomorrow?" That escalated <laughs> quickly, didn't it? And what did Adi the Engels say? He, he laughed. He and confirmed said, well, that he would start. As far as I know, yeah. Just yeah. I mean, did he think they were taking the piss? 
Come I on, guys. I think he might have done. I think he might have done. Well, we do a, a quick Tale of the Tapa, not a Napalm style, uh, very detailed or thorough Tale of the Tapa, but 196 kilometers, 196 kilometers, that's what I just said. Say 16 from Lovere to Ponte di Le- Legno. How's that? Is that's that right? That's okay. Half, that's pretty bad. Pretty, bad. Yeah, pretty <laughs> awful. Pretty awful. Joe Dombrowski told you he was going to go on the break today at he the did. start, Daniel, and he did. The break went very early in the first few kilometers. Some big names in there. Dombrowski is a big name, a long name anyway. Uh, Mikel Nieve <laughs> was there. Giulio Ciccone was there. Uh, Fausto Masnada was there. Sage winner, of course. Jan Hurt was there, Andre Amador, uh, Peo Bilbao, I'm not going to list all the names, but uh, there were some important figures there from uh, teams like Mitchelton Scott, Movistar, uh, Barry Merida, uh, Caruso was there for them. So it was an interesting big 22-man break. They built up a lead of 5.30 as they started the Mortarolo, and it really started to fracture up the climb. Jan Hurt was very aggressive, Nievi went with him, Dombrowski, Caruso, uh, Ciccone and Masnada, uh, Dombrowski was the first of those guys to, to lose contact and it, it just broke up until going over the top it was just Jan Hurt and uh, Ciccone and Ciccone took the points over the summit and those two came into the finish together uh, and I think uh, Ciccone was a deserving winner uh, Hurt not quite as uh, didn't contribute quite as much to the to the effort as Ciccone and you know he's tried a lot in this Giro so just reward for him we'll hear from his teammate Balka Molima a bit later on um, in the bunch uh, movies in the bunch there wasn't a bunch there was chasers movie star uh, were uh, they had a few numbers in the chasing group protecting Richard Carapaz Mikel Landa and um, Spider- Spider-Man, Spider-Man uh, took off at one point with uh, Peo Bilbao who'd dropped back from the break and it looked like he might gain back a bit of time but then he was caught and dropped and he lost a few seconds in the end um, so the, the big losers today really were uh, Primoz Roglic who did lose contact on the Mortirolo and lost a bit of time, so did Simon Yates and uh, Carapaz and Nibali, uh, well, they, they both sort of consolidated their positions. Nibali, very, very aggressive on the Mortirolo, got Can we away. Have some time gaps, please? At some point, getting to that. Uh, Hugh Carthy uh, bridged across to Nibali on the Mortirolo, putting a very, very good ride indeed. And in the end, uh, Carapaz is the leader now by 147. Nibali has leapfrogged Roglic, uh, who is now at 2 minutes 9 seconds, so he's fallen a bit further behind. Uh, Landa moved up a place. Uh, Rafael Maika had a bad day. He moved down a couple of places. Um, Lopez uh, moved up three places. He's seventh overall now. Sami Yates uh, remains eighth. Pavel Sivakov lost a bit of time, but he remains ninth. And uh, Jan Plants is dropping down the classification as Carthy and Dombrowski move up. Uh, so that's the GC, and that's the tale of the Tapa. Wow. The fastest clothing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. Well, I think uh, right from the beginning of Rafa, uh, Simon and I have enjoyed conversations and uh, geeky conversations about finer details. And I did a lot of work with Rafa right from the beginning of you know of time I think we just share a lot of values really purity is one of them and the love of everyday cycling as well as uh, mass start uh, world championships track etc Paul won't remember this but I wrote to him about 20 years ago and I don't think the letter even got to you do you remember one of the chaps who ran the business for you I managed to get to him and I sent him a letter saying I know that Paul's a cycling fan and bike racing is a bit in the doldrums and it's really cheap and I understand that maybe Europe's your expansion market so I think you should sponsor a professional cycling team (laughs) didn't get a reply at that point but I'm not surprised why but um, I always used to wear Paul's clothes and still do and there was an aesthetic that I really liked and then obviously him being a cycling fan it, it just very naturally bled into lots of what he did so it was a very comfortable friendship Well, the voices we heard there were Sir Paul Smith and Simon Mottram. Paul Smith, the designer, of course. I'm sure you're a fan of his, Brian. You're a man of taste. Yeah, I actually uh, I live in a town in Italy where he comes by quite often because he has a house very nearby and he is a real gentleman. Where well, is the house? His, his house. Forte de Marmi. Oh, okay. With Oleg. 
Another man of great taste. I love they have off. nothing in common. <laughs> they have nothing in common. Uh, well, that was Paul Smith in conversation with Rafa, founder and chief executive Simon Mottram. Uh, we'll be hearing a bit from their conversation over the course of the final week of the Giro to mark the launch of a new range of Rafa Paul Smith design clothing for uh, members of the Rafa Cycling Club. It's available available in very limited quantities in the following Rafa clubhouses. Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Hong Kong, London, Los Angeles, Melbourne, New York, Seoul, Taipei, and Tokyo. And the, the inspiration for the design um, is a challenge that was set to uh, Rafa's designer, Angelo Trofa. The challenge was, if Paul Smith had a racing team in the 1960s, what would the kit look like? Uh, you can have a look at it at rafa.cc. It's very nice indeed. Uh, if you just search rafa.cc RCC Paul Smith, you will find it. Um, and we'll hear more from Paul Smith and Simon Mottram over the course of the week. So, chaps, it was a, it was a, it was a great stage. I mean, lots of talk about climbs being axed from the route today, but there were suggestions that it might actually make for a more exciting stage. The weather was a, a factor too. We did we did see an exciting stage and we learned a little bit about who's likely to win the Giro, didn't we? Yeah, I think it was a really good day for Movistar, wasn't it? Um, they were able to sort of use Nibali in a way. I think Max Chandri said yesterday in the Spanish press, Max Chandri being the Movistar uh, director sportif, that they were going to use Nibali as a kind of bulldozer to get rid of Roglic and that's kind of exactly what happened, isn't it? And there wasn't too much petulance from, from Nibali and there wasn't too much sort of turning around and saying, why aren't you guys working? Um, so they got off quite lightly. On, well, Nibali, I mean, it was a very dramatic attack quite early on the Mortarola, wasn't it, from Nibali? He, he looked great, but Movistar didn't panic at all, which I thought was quite impressive. A, a young rider like Carapaz, who's been irresistible on the climbs, he just, you know, I don't know if he's had somebody in his ear, but he, he, he rode that very very well didn't he no he's very he's calm and collected and I think when I saw Nibali attacking it looked as if he didn't really care what state of uh, mind or, or what kind of legs Roglic had at that point he wanted to go irregardless and I think he was probably a little bit early because Movistar was their strength in numbers today was, was the key to what was potentially I think the stage that could help Carapaz significantly win the, the race. I mean, to ask an existential question, what is the point of attacking on the Mortarola? At attacking as opposed to riding at a rhythm that's faster than someone else's. It's um, exciting, it's dramatic. It is and exciting, it's, and, and it plays a, to the... a showman, yeah, I exactly. would say. Um, but would he... I, I mean, no one can say how much, um, how many watts he lost in that attack. Perhaps none. Perhaps it didn't affect his rhythm in the rest of the climb. But um, I'm not sure it achieved that much. It didn't achieve anything in the end other than to lose Roglic. But the point that you made earlier, Daniel, is that Nibali looks really, really good and, and better than he's looked, you said, in a, in a Grand Tour since the 2014 Tour de France. Well, Rich, I asked his coach, Paolo Slonga, whether that was the case, whether he was, uh, whether this was the best Nibali we've seen since 2014. Here's what he said. It's definitely one of the best Nibali's we've seen, and I mean in terms of how strong he is on the bike and how relaxed he is off it. He knows that he's feeling good, but he also knows there's a lot of time to make up, so he keeps trying. As far as his data is concerned, his numbers are up there with the best he's ever done. I think the key thing for us was that he found his form at the perfect time, just as the race was starting. Consequently, he's got some real zip in his legs still. Unfortunately, at the moment, Carapaz shows no signs of falling apart. So, Richie heard Slonga there saying this was one of the best Nibali's ever. Um, I mean, he's better than Antonio, we know that. But what other Nibali's? <laughs> what, what other Nibali's um, are, in the, are in the conversation? Nibali, the 2014 vintage, the 2013 vintage, 2016 vintage. But yeah, this, I think we've tended to see him up. 2014 tour accepted 2016 he came to the boil pretty late in the race didn't he whereas here he's he's been getting better and looking good and looking aggressive and the thing about Nibali is the point that people keep making is he's not here for second place or third place is he no but you still have to he in my opinion he cannot win the Giro unless Carapaz uh, cracks he needs to have a, a terrible day he'll never be alone I think Carapaz like he 
he's supported better than anyone right now in the bike race. So Nibali can only win this Giro and avoid being second if Carapaz has a horrible day. I've got a great question for Brian. Um, this is going to put the cat amongst the pigeons. So Brian, you've got experience of working in teams uh, as a communications director and as a team manager. Um, yesterday, uh, a pod, there was a podcast that um, communicated the, the, the news, or maybe we should call it a rumor. Rumors swirling around Carapaz. That, that Carapaz might be leaving, well, he's probably leaving Movistar at the end of the year for a rival team. Um, this is probably going to blow up in the next few days. Um, people are, are, are going to cotton on to this, this piece of news. Once they've listened what, to the podcast. What effects will that have on Movistar, Carapaz, Landa, Team Morale? First of all, I'm, you know, if you look at them internally, if the, the co- coherence is, is still you know, well-functioning. Landa has never been someone who has been that good at riding for other captains, but I think he's doing a good job at it here. And I think it also would help him to catapult himself further up in the classement should things explode once again. It's a very, I think, well-structured team. And there's always the, the question, and I don't really think it matters if riders are going or staying, how, do you, how are you able to be as loyal as possible if you still have ambitions yourself? And I think that Landa is, is the key person to ask that question at Movistar. And I don't really think it matters whether Carapaz is staying or leaving. If, if he has the backing of Landa, he will, in my opinion, be very likely to win the Giro. And I think that's all that serves the purpose of the team. And I think they have Landa under control. I don't think they should worry so much about Carapaz because he has the same interest than they do. But they have to figure it out so that Landa is, is going to do his job. I think they've played it pretty perfectly so far. How about um, Carapaz himself? If, if there is this... Uncertainty if his team movie star don't know that he intends to leave for another team and are, and are about to find out. So. I mean, yeah. There's a different story circulating, and I think that was part of your conversation as well the other day, that a team has actually apparently done that deal a long time ago and, and maybe had a lot of contact with him in the interim period. And that, I think, is needs to be criticized, and it's not really fair play. I don't know who Carapaz's agent is, but if, if it's who I fear it is... Then I think that that might be his. Car- his Carapaz's his agent um, is uh, Giuseppe Acquadro, who is the agent to uh, a lot of South American riders. And um, at last count, mm, seven or eight, or maybe even more riders at uh, Team Ineos. Well, he has he has before had the the mo of contracting or semi-contracting riders way out before they actually were supposed and even able to change. I think that's, you know, he'll definitely deny that. But I, I've seen that happen personally, that he's sent off riders elsewhere long before the, the deadline of their contract. So maybe that's what happened here as well. Luke, we've been joined by... Fratelli d'Italia, d'Italia, sedesta. Ciro Scognamilio, it's been a few days, Ciro. <laughs> Ciao, dear listeners. Uh, Very happy to be here again. What about the topic of of today? The Giro or maybe the heavy rain? I was outside for one hour without an umbrella, dear listeners. What a mess. This could be quite explosive tonight, Rich, because Brian Brian has been tweeting um, and and criticizing Chiro's Chiro's employer, Chiro's newspaper, La Gazzetta. Did you see that, Chiro? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Obviously, uh, I didn't write the articles... uh, the articles to which uh, Brian was referring. What were about they about, discri- Brian? What, what was the article about that you were referring to? Uh, the article was about the aftermath of Roglic's missing bike, and there was some kind of specul- well, massive speculation attached to the fact that it wasn't on the team car that came in, yeah, yeah. and there was waiting, and the speculation in one of the finest sports newspapers and most cited ones during the Giro was that there might have been some kind of uh, controversy that need to, needed to be hidden about this bike. Yeah, um, my comment... <laughs> that's, it's the, really that's the easy. nicest way I can put it. No, no, but my comment is really easy. Uh, it seems that uh, we are in democracy, so there is the absolute freedom for Brian or anyone else to criticize our articles. Why not? It's a pleasure. <laughs> that means, first of all, that the Gazzetta is uh, really uh, read by uh, tifosi, by journalists, by all the people. So why not? Okay, can I, can I qualify that a little bit, though? 
because I would like to turn this a little, yeah, somehow actually into a discussion about what journalism is and isn't. And I think, in my opinion, you know, now working on the other side of the fence, but that's actually always been my opinion. As a journalist, you initially have to establish what you don't know. And you have to take for granted that what you don't know could be a very central element to the point you're trying to make. And if there's something that you don't know, you will try and find a source that can confirm or shed some light on those facts that you're missing. And in this case, and that's actually why I was uh, somewhat upset about reading this, because I really highly regard La Gazzetta and especially Chiro, who I've known for years, that the sources who could either confirm or deny or factually put some background to this were right outside where the journalist in question were writing well, the story. Well, th- this concerns Roglic's bike, which uh, appeared to go missing, the bike that he that he uh, gave to Antoine Tolhook. It then went apparently missing. Now... Tolhook was given a spare bike by Movistar, and in fact, uh, Roglic's bike came in on the Movistar team car, but clearly nobody thought to look there. Uh, and I don't think the team actually really knew what had happened to it at the finish. But, you know, th- this is, this, this, these sorts of questions are a legacy, aren't they, of the doping yeah, but, years? Yeah, but honestly, yeah, that still means that there's an, uh, there's an untold story about where the bike was. But from that to, without any facts to back it up, insinuate that there would be some kind of clandestine setup of Roglic's now on the roof of the Movistar team car is absurd. Well, we know that now, don't we? We know that now. We know that now, but if we wanted to know it yesterday, as did, for instance, the Spanish newspaper El País, they could have gone and searched and gotten the relevant information. mm, The problem is, okay, in the afternoon of Como, the situation was not clear, but uh, it's also true that on on our website, gazeta.it, already yesterday in the first afternoon, there was the explanation of Max Chandri about what happened. There is a video that anyone can see uh, on our website. And then uh, I agree with Brian words, especially about the function of journalists, but dear listeners, we have to be clear. I mean, if we need, if we want to speak about the function of journalism, the rules, the ethic, I mean, we need a 24-hour podcast. So maybe not now, but Just maybe in the thing, future. Just one thing, Chira, one thing. Some people will look at this whole controversy, small controversy, and they'll see this is part of a, this um, is a, there's a rich tradition of La Gazzetta causing mischief with foreign rights. Riders to for, with foreign riders to to favour an Italian rider. Nibali is the national hero here. Some people might look at this and say this is like this is like Laurent Fignon in 1984 when um, you know the Stelvia stage was cancelled or when the helicopter flew over his head and and um, caused him issues in the final time trial. Uh, I have a clear answer for this. Absolutely not true. Be not true because certainly we are journalists we can commit mistakes as every human being but we are not tifosi and for example uh, you know uh, all our listeners know that I am, I am the shadow of the shark but for example <laughs> but for exa- yes I mean, imagine my life how is dear listeners to be a shadow of a shark you can't imagine <laughs> but uh, I remember for example three years ago in the tour 2016 before the Olympics if you remember in that year anybody won the Giro and then went to the tour Nibali was really upset with us for all the tour because he lost immediately a lot of minutes and so he was for him he was not able to do the double in the same year every day Nibali was upset with us I think also, am I not right in thinking also that Gazetta um, published uh, stories linking Dr. Ferrari to Nibli's team Astana a couple of years ago? Uh, well, it was something, uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, there, from our sources at a certain point, it seemed, it seemed uh, but with no certainties, that uh, there, w- there was the presence of the doctor in yeah. the hotel team in Montecatini. What I mean is they published the story. I, it, what, it, you know, yeah. I'm not saying it, was, it stood up in the end, but no, no. I'm just defending Ch- Gazetta here because they also published the stories about Cipollini as well, didn't they? Oh, absolutely. He was on the front page when he was uh, involved in the Operation Puerto <laughs> case. But no, the mistake is not made because we are against foreign riders, foreign riders and pro-Italian riders. Not at all, for sure. We are, you know, r- foreign riders, Richard, or Italian riders. But at the end, who cares? You know that I care <laughs> about... Uh, about uh, it's not necessary to say because 
our listeners already know this. <laughs> it's so really unfortunate that gesture, gesturing cannot feature on a podcast because what I just yeah. saw was beautiful. He actually grabbed my hands there. It was, it was, yeah, it was <laughs> there he goes, there he goes. Oh, well, a little diversion there. What were we talking about? The stage. Yes. Dario Cataldo, Astana, stage winner on Sunday. Anyway, we have to to do some some effort, some work because uh, we know in a start like this, like today, on a climb, especially when it's uh, when it's cold or anyway bad weather like this, uh, it's very hard if you don't do nothing. So uh, so anyway, even if, if it was raining, we had some fun training on uh, on the home training. So. Uh, but anyway, we enjoyed uh, the rest day. <laughs> well, you must have enjoyed the rest day uh, after after your efforts the other day. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was realizing more what the, what happened the, the day before, and was very very the best rest day in my in my life. So you kept the engine running yesterday. What, just an hour on the turbo trainer, was it? Yeah, exactly. Just to sweat a little bit to to keep the the engine uh, on. So. Today we'll see a very fast start, so it will be useful. Jack Bauer, Mitchelton Scott. I don't like the rollers. Diego, neither does he. Do you, do you, are we you expected also? the rain to come in at midday. It pretty much arrived when we departed the hotel. We got a good soaking out there. I mean, when you only get two days off in 21, it's important to try and keep as low stress and enjoyable as possible. For me, that means definitely not riding ergos, you know. I broke my uh, shoulder blade in Roubaix a couple of weeks ago. So I've been on the ergo a lot prior to the race, you know. So I was definitely not getting back on it yesterday. Nate Brown, EF Education First. I mean, it's taken me a bit to figure out how my body reacts to the rest day, but I'm the type of guy who can do 45 minutes and come out of the rest day just fine. So being that it rained yesterday, I just got in the trainer uh, for a little 45-minute uh, spin, and I feel fine today, and hopefully uh, the rest of the day I'll feel good. Uh, this morning I got up at 8 o'clock, breakfast was at 8.30 and we had to leave by 9, so it was a pretty rushed morning, not very relaxed, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's how it is sometimes. I had a lot of oatmeal and some rice, so I went big today. <laughs> we came into the race with no top favorites, and it's fun to watch guys like Hugh Carthy and Joe Dombrowski who have been workers in the past get their chance to shine and have their moments. and. I love working for those guys. They're super easy going. They're very appreciative, and it's easy to help guide them through the race. You can understand Hugh's accent, okay? No, I do not know what he says on the radio. Anytime he talks, I'm like, Hugh, I, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> Luke Durbridge, Mitchelton Scott. For me, personally, I need to do something substantial, but that was on the ergo. Uh, it was on the home trainer. I had to get a bit of a sweat on, uh, did about an hour or so. So, But there was uh, two guys that went on the road, and... Uh, Hats off to them, but uh, it was it was pissing rain and there was no way I was going on the road. Who, who were they? Uh, yours truly, Simon Yates and uh, and Jack Bauer. Simon Yates, very dedicated, obviously. I think but... so, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty early after the rest day. Uh, I mean, every day's been quite different. We've had some super long stages, so we've had to uh, travel a fair bit. Hasn't been that big of transfers this year in terms of on the bus, but I think because we've ridden most of the kilometres ourselves... Yeah, I mean, obviously we'd like to get a stage. I mean, we've been two seconds now and a third, um, so we're, we're knocking on the door. Um, and Simon's getting better every day. So, to be honest, we're not giving up GC. Um, you know, obviously he's not where we ideally wanted to be, but we've got to go through the process. Our team's transitioning into a GC team, and, um, you know, if that's a top 10, a podium, top 15, doesn't matter to us. we just got to go through the process of riding GC. So Simon's motivated. He's going to keep going every day, and hopefully we can get a stage in, in, in there as well. Simon Yates, Mitchelton Scott. I woke up at 8 on the button. Um, first thing I thought was I need a coffee. Um, that's about it. My breakfast has been the same every day. I've had a ham and cheese omelette, two egg omelette, uh, two slices of bread, two pieces of butter. Uh, I'm missing my baked beans from home though, I'll be honest. Um, and then a big bowl of cereal. Uh, Eddie Dunbar, Team Niels. Yeah, I was up at half seven and then yeah, went straight straight to breakfast. The usual for me it was just uh, 
biggest bowl of porridge I could get in and um, yeah, fuel for today. Um, going back to the room then for a while, did a bit of stretching just to get the legs kind of functioning before a hard start today. Um, and yeah, just looking forward to getting today over and done with. <laughs> for sure, it's still going to be a hard day, but I think it's um, less difficult than it was scheduled to be. Your words, not mine. I'm Joe Dombrowski of Team EF Education First. I woke up at 8 o'clock to an alarm. I ate rice, avocado, and a two-egg omelet. And then woke up thinking, oh, I could have slept longer. Which is nice, because sometimes I usually wake up before my alarm. Not too stressed. <laughs> Yet. Why? <laughs> uh, should I be? Well, that was a little medley from the start. We were speaking to writers about um, the, 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 the logistics of getting to the start today quite an early start a lot of them had quite a long journey to get there it was a long stage and it was a tricky rest day because a lot of the riders were in let's say less less than salubrious hotels yeah although i got in trouble for that did you i i cast aspersions on zingonia which i described yesterday as the bergamasco compton or moss side and um, marco pinotti the former uh, lamprey rider htc rider He's from uh, Bergamo, and he listens to us oh. very kindly of Marco. Um, and he said that it's, it's not quite as bad as it's made out. Marco lives down the road. He, well, he lives five kilometers away from Zingonia. He doesn't live in Zingonia. Corrections corner there. But um, it was a miserable day, and it was raining. And so a lot of the riders were reduced to uh, riding on their turbo trainers rather than going out on the road. So, and, and rest days are difficult, and some riders need to do quite a lot, and some riders recover the day after a rest day. Um, so that was uh, a little taste of flavor of what some of the riders got up to. Well, Daniel, you mentioned the main winners today were Movistar, and you spoke to the, the head honcho at the finish. I did. Eusebio, uh, the very suave Eusebio Unzue. Bueno, un paso. It's another important step forward for us because we managed to increase the gap to Roglic. It was a day when the team was sensational and also one which confirmed how strong Nibali is. As we all saw today, he's very brave and he's at a level that we hadn't seen from him for a long time. Today was the hardest, most selective stage we'll see in this last week and we also had to be cautious because the day after a rest day can play strange tricks. Roglic gave us an opportunity that we had to exploit. We know that he's a rider who could put four or five seconds a kilometre into Carapaz and Landa in a time trial. That sounds a lot, but he's put almost four seconds a kilometre into Carapaz over the 43 kilometres of time trial so far. Admittedly, the last TT is always a bit different. Strength and freshness count for a lot. But by the same token, a good time trialist will always do a good time trial unless he's absolutely dead. So it sounds like Unzue is not counting his chickens yet no and and no one is willing to completely count out Roglic but um, I think the mood around Jumbo Visma is that it's they're going to need a miracle now and we sort of sensed this yesterday Rich at uh, the press conference didn't we uh, I wouldn't say that uh, Roglic was evasive but when we asked him about you know what was his best day of the year what was his worst day he sort of indicated that things were you know, not in a downward spiral but um, he certainly was no longer in the ascendancy well he said he had a, his worst day was Sunday he said he had, a, he had a bad day on Sunday yeah but before they, they were speculating whether he was vulnerable and now they, they know who he is he was vulnerable today he was isolated more than any part early in the race and when Nibali put in the attack he might not have suffered initially because he's usually a rider that, that doesn't go into the red that easily, but he always tries to find try to find his own rhythm. Today he was suffering, and today he lost time because maybe it's to be, maybe it is on a downward spiral. But he's definitely a, he's way more moving target now that they know they can get they can get one in. We watched the finish with Thomas Decker, didn't we? And he had some interesting thoughts about the way that Roglic had ridden, and that True. at certain points earlier in the race he could have maybe formed alliances yeah, with. Tom- Tom's kind of thought that they'd been a bl- the the Jumbo Visma had that had sort of adopted the position of well being in pole position and, and really having to defend quite early in the race. Whereas a bit like Simon Yates last yeah, year, yeah, when at that point in the race when Roglic was still probably well, as strong as anyone, he should have been looking to gain time. And this whole kind of shadow boxing that went on with um, Nibali, particularly on the stage of Lago Seru. Um, it had penalised Roglic because really he should have just got on with it and he should have um, pulled with Nibali and they should have identified in Carapaz a common en- enemy. But at that point, I think 
Carapaz was still very much flying under the radar. I understand there's been quite harsh criticism of Jumbo Visma uh, from our colleagues on Eurosport uh, in the UK. And I think that's very harsh. They haven't been able to support him, but they've had a lot of bad luck. I mean, losing Hessink on the eve of the race, losing Lawrence de Plus to illness early in the race. Had those two been here, it, it might have been a completely different race. They've got, instead of a very experienced and good rider and a very strong rider, they've got three very young riders. And one of those young riders would have been fine, I think. Antoine Toluk would have been would have been fine with those other two. But the point is that they lost Hessink days before the year. They lost uh, de Plus in the w- first week. They couldn't have replaced Hessink with a Stephen Kreuzwick or a George Bennett because you can't change those guys' programs as, as easily as that, whereas Sepkus was brought in instead of going to the Tour of California. So it's not bad management or bad planning. It's bad luck. I agree with that, but then again, if you really setting the bar for trying to win a Grand Tour, you, you need to have some kind of risk management around your roster as well. With the seven guys you put around your, your team captain, or the person you really think can finish the job, it's it's kind of not okay that because shit happens and all of a sudden you need to replace someone. And if you don't have at least one guy who might as well have been in the first lineup, it's it's you might end up actually being one guy short that tempers with your whole project. Have Jumbo Visma been too ambitious in their recruitment in the sense that I know Richard Plugger had this kind of mission, this vision that um, at the Tour de France in particular, but I think for all of the Grand Tours, he wanted to be competitive every single day at all times, particularly at the Tour de France. So he always wanted to have a sprinter and he always wanted to have a general classification rider. Now, if you sort of branch out, if you kind of draw a, a sort of expanding circles around you know, those sprinters and those GC guys, you know, you, you need a whole backup team for the sprinter, a whole backup team for the for the climber. And um, on a budget like Jumbo Visma's, I think it's a reasonable budget. I don't know exactly how much it is, but it's not Team Ineos. Um, it's quite a difficult thing to achieve. And you look at a team like Astana, um, they've completely shunned sprinting, really. Um, they're sort of, they've decided not to live beyond their means and and maybe it's a question of prioritisation well a team that's had a disappointing season but is having a good Giro is Trek Segafredo kind of your old team Brian yeah in a way it's an evolution of of what was Leopard Trek back in the day isn't yes. it? Yeah, there's, there's, um, uh, there's some remnants of that. That's there are sure. some quite a few remnants of that. Yeah, Balka Molima uh, is riding well, fifth overall, and they got the stage one today that they've been trying to get. So I spoke to uh, Balka Molima at the finish, and um, I asked him as well about a tweet that he put out on Sunday night about the motorbikes at the Giro, which he feels have been interfering too much with the racing. And after that, we'll hear what he's been reading during this Giro. Yeah, really good day. Uh, you know, it was super nice to win a stage. Uh, that was a big goal for the team this uh, this Giro, and uh, yeah, Chicona did it. I mean, and I think he's also gonna win the mountain jersey now, more or less. Was he, he was first on Motorola? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think then he's pretty close that already. Is, yeah. So that's yeah, that's great for the team and uh, for the atmosphere in the team, and uh, yeah, and also for me, I moved up one one place in GC today. Uh, yeah, felt pretty good on on the climb on the Motorola bit better I think than the last week on in, in the climb so yeah I'm also quite uh, satisfied. You tweeted the other day about the, the motorbikes on, on Sunday stage and um, that's clearly a, a big problem as far as you're concerned. Yeah it is I mean uh, I think the motorbikes are uh, well a big problem in cycling uh, not only this Giro but uh, maybe in this Giro it's 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 a bit worse than uh, in, in many other races I mean I think the safety is a problem with the motorbikes, uh, especially when they pass the peloton uh, too fast or too close. I think I think that's going pretty pretty well in this Giro. Uh, there's not that many motorbikes, uh, for example, as, as in the Tour de France, so that's well that's good. But uh, yeah, on the other hand, the, the motorbikes, especially this Giro, riders are co- complaining already since the first day that they are too close. Uh, the, the television motorbikes, especially too close in front of the, the peloton and yeah also the breakaways uh, I think so it can and affect the racing yeah it affects the race I mean and that, that's clear I mean uh, the, the, the guys that are pulling in the peloton have a big advantage when the motorbike is only 10-20 meters in front uh, you know not only aerodynamic wise but also when you you have a focus point that is that close I mean in a time trial everybody is always hoping to have a motorbike uh, that is pretty close you know to have a have a goal instead of an empty road in front of you and I think that's really uh, influencing the race uh, it can even in the end be the, be the difference between 
uh, somebody winning a Giro or not winning a Giro uh, at certain certain points. So yeah, in my opinion, that's really really bad, and yeah, I'm disappointed that even uh, when riders and teams are complaining, CPA is complaining since the first day of the Giro, but nothing is changing. And it's, yeah, it looks like the, the Rai has has more influence in uh, in this race than uh, than the UCI has, um, and that's that's a pity. Mm. The Israeli Israeli writer uh, from Sapiens, but then I read oh, yeah. the, the second book, Homo, Homo Deus, and the third one, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. So that's some light reading. Yeah, well, that was not too light, uh, but I finished those already the first two weeks, and now I'm into a, a thriller from Baldacci. Oh, that, I just finished that, and a new one from uh, Grisham, so a bit more light uh, reading for the last week. <laughs> The Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. You can get 25% off your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. And thank you to them. They've supported us since the 2016 Giro. Um, now, uh, we heard from Balcom Olam at the end of the last part. Impressive uh, reading list for him. He's, he's reading some pretty... Um, heavy tomes uh, some light reading he said in the final week he's reading uh, John Grisham this week but he's been reading some pretty impressive books I remember when uh, Chris Yule Jensen was doing his first Grand Tour and he's very much a reader Same, himself yeah. and he asked me to bring him books and he said I, I need something heavy something that will make me think not so much about the race but other things and I remember bringing him Plato the State and uh, Celine's Journey to the End of the Night and he read and finished both because I quizzed him on them. Well, we did an episode uh, on cyclists who, who who read books. I mean, that makes it sound really unusual. Uh, there are quite a lot of cyclists that read books, but writers who like whose entertainment at a Grand Tour is is books. Um, for an episode of Kilometer Zero a couple of years ago, and Chris Yule Jensen was on it, as was uh, Balka Molima. Um, so. What else, chaps? I mean, Daniel, you were back on the Gianni Savio beat today, weren't you? I did, and we're in Fausto Masnada country, or we, we're sort of going a bit, bit north of Fausto Masnada country. He's from the um, Val or Val Brembilla, um, closer to Bergamo. But his fan club were out in force today, and um, going to hear a bit of the noise they were creating at the finish, and then Gianni Savio. The formation uh, was, uh, was uh, different to other day for the reason that uh, today uh, was uh, uh, one, one, two, five. One is the rider that uh, uh, <clears throat> must uh, away the next stage because a sprinter today is only to save and uh, <clears throat> two the two climbers Catania and Masnada uh, to go in uh, breakaway and uh, the other, <laughs> other <laughs> to finish the stage because uh, many compliments uh, <clears throat> many compliments for all the riders all the riders that finish it this, uh, this stage is uh, a Giro d'Italia very, very hard. Gianni, I've got one question for you. You are famous for discovering talents in South America. Why did you not discover Richard Carapaz? Yes, many people asked me, but I was uh, never I was in Ecuador. I don't know Ecuador. I was in uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, Chile... Uh, Bolivia, but not in Ecuador. At this moment, not in Ecuador. But uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, that uh, maybe that uh, there will be some news uh, in Ecuador. Maybe. So maybe that's where your next holiday is going to be in Ecuador. <laughs> not the next uh, holiday, but uh, but uh, maybe maybe. 
So that was Gianni Savio, who may or may not have had a meeting with Dave Brailsford and the aforementioned agent on the rest day. Um, I overheard them arranging that last week. I uh, wonder who that was about. I'm not sure, but it sounds like Gianni is going to be going to Ecuador on his holidays. Next yeah, I'll bet he is. Year. I'll bet he is. <laughs> I mean, that's what he said. Um, just a quick word before we, we look ahead. Um, on the, the two EF Education First writers, I spoke to Alberto Bettiol, uh, who was here commentating for Rai today. He's that been one. training in Livigno, and uh, he dropped in today on the Giro, Tour of Flanders winner, of course. Uh, and he said that, that in the commentary, everyone was very impressed with Hugh Carthy's ride on the Mortirolo to bridge up to a flying Nibali and, and stay with him, turning himself inside out to do so. Uh, really st- another strong performance from him and Joe Dombrowski, who was in that break. And, uh, you know, that gave him, you know, he wasn't on a good day today, he said. I spoke to him at the finish. He crashed a couple of days ago and he, he said that, you know, the body goes into shock and there are all kinds of effects from a crash that we don't necessarily know about. He said you can put on weight, you know, through inflammation and so on. Uh, so he wasn't on a good day you today. On, you can definitely put on weight in the Jira through other things as well. Oh, so you can, I'm finding you know, that. Like meat and... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But um, he was glad that he was in the break because it gave him the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the lead that he needed to be able to finish with the GC guys. Another interesting point he made was that, you know, being in the position he was, having been dropped going over the top of the mortar, that he could really get dressed up for the descent and get properly protected. He had a team car with him. And these are the things that might just play out over the next few days, how riders, what kind of state they were in today um, at various points and at the finish. Because it can take you days to recover from that sort of freezing cold um, so we'll see but uh, yeah another very strong day for Dombrowski and Hugh Carthy and both of them are sort of inching towards the top 10 what are we expecting from tomorrow fellas well we're heading into German speaking Switzerland Switzerland um, even <laughs> Daniel, Italy even Italy um, I, I, I like that area significantly more than I like this area I, I was going to ask you Brian and this is we're two and a half weeks in now to is, is it your first Giro as a as a journalist, the first yes. one you've actually travelled with. And what have you learned about Italy in the last two and a half weeks that you didn't already know? You, you've lived in Italy for quite a while. I've seen places I haven't, haven't seen before, but just the... Uh, Pleasant surprises, disappointments? I think just the, the, the sheer vastness of it all when you're actually driving a car yourself, you know, from the, from the bottom end in Puglia to up towards where we're going in the next couple of days close to Austria. The diversity, linguistic diversities, cuisine... Everything. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it all in. I'm, I'm trying to be quite sort of humble and agnostic to trying to see new elements of the country that I live in. And I, take the, I try and take the good with the bad. This, the book I'm writing is also about my frustrations about a country that I love very much. And, and because of the, the, be- the beauty of it, some of it hidden and, and some of it not. I, I, I find myself more and more... At home here, more places I see, even if I see places that that are very far from the Italy that I know already. I was asked uh, by our friend colleague um, Hannah Troop from she's a press officer at EF Education First this morning about linguistic diversity. It still bowls people over that we well we will go to part of Italy tomorrow where um, Italian is very much the second language. I remember the the first Giro. I ever did. We were down towards Naples, and uh, I, my Italian wasn't well. It was not existent, to be fair. And I was overhearing a conversation, and I, I didn't think of it at all as being Italian, but it was in sort of the, the Napolitano hinterland, and I didn't understand a word of it. I'm not sure I would today, actually. No, I don't. These understand. things are fascinating. There's a German-speaking part of Belgium as well. There's a, a German-speaking part of Jamaica. <laughs> And, and, there's a, and, there's a, and there's a well, and there's a well speaking uh, part of uh, Argentina. So what certainly does, what does Scotland a, certainly have a in large a large Welsh community in in uh, Argentina, isn't there? So these, these little pockets are fascinating. Well, I actually they? know that north of where I live, there's a small Scottish enclave in uh, Castel Nuovo Gafaniana. In Barga. Yes, I, I've been yes. there. Yeah, it's unbelievable. But don't they uh, play cricket? There? I wouldn't I know. It's, it's, it's one valley over from where I live, so I never. I've just been on holiday there, and they, they, um, everywhere you go, as soon as they start speaking to you with an English accent, it's a strong Scottish Glaswegian accent, and a lot of them are, they're Italian um, by ancestry, but they've been first generation, second generation immigrants to Scotland who've moved back there and and settled there, and a lot of Scottish people. So why uh, live did you there go? As well. <laughs> to, to sample Italy 
through a Scottish lens. <laughs> No, it was just out of curiosity. Out of thing. curiosity. <laughs> okay. Anyway, should we wrap things well, up? Well, let's just say one thing about tomorrow's stage. It's going to be won by Bob Youngles. Oh, you've, you, that's your tip, isn't it? Yeah, I've been thinking this for a while, looking at this profile. It reminds me a little bit of the stage that TJ Van Garderen won a couple of years ago in Ortizé. Similar-ish kind of profile, I seem to remember, although I haven't checked that. Um, he was kind of out of general classification at the time um, in a similar fashion to Jungels. Jungels is still in the race. I don't know how he got on today, whether he's um, whether he was sort of saving his legs or whether he's you know tired and, and in terrible form, but... I think it could suit him tomorrow. I'm just looking up Germans in Jamaica because <laughs> I, I knew this rang a bell. I knew I'd read about this. Um, and uh, there was a German-speaking part of Jamaica. Um, I'm not sure they still speak German, but some German words have entered the Jamaican vernacular. So there you go. And uh, there's a German town, Westmoreland, uh, uh, in uh, in Jamaica, which is very heavy German influence. There you go. Yeah, man. Anyway. So where else we go tomorrow? Sorry, Rich. Um, uh, about 40 kilometers from the finish, we go to a place called Falces, famous for a uh, about a 50 kilometer solo, solo ish break by Damiano Cunego to win the Giro in 2004. Cunego was in the press room, he today. was here, he was announcing some kind of new venture. Do you know who else was at the Giro today? Davide Rebellin, who was riding the e Giro, apparently. <sighs> You're kidding me. Um, Davide Rebellin is retiring at the Italian National Championships in a few weeks' time, he'll probably win them. Especially if he's on an e-bike. Especially if he's on an e-bike. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, enough about e-bikes and motors and so on. Brian, thanks very much for joining us again. Will you join us again before the end of the Giro? Anytime, let's. And like I said today, and, and can you need you to plan ahead. Can you sneak us into your restaurant in Verona That's as well? That's what I was trying to I was getting to that point because I realized that all the good restaurants on Sunday, the last night, are closed. So you guys need just, to get your shit together. Just before we go, tell us why you've chosen this restaurant. Because you go to great lengths to pick out the best restaurants. Tell us which resources you use because I know you take this very seriously, and why you've booked this one in Verona. Well, first of all, the, the, the book I used to use is, is now an app, and it's the Guida del Espresso, and it's uh, published by what I believe to be one of the few independent newspapers in Italy, La Repubblica, and they have their own food guide, as you do in Italy, very important. So try and look, up, look that up, and they actually have a, a, a very smart app where you can geolocate yourself towards the nearest good restaurant in the area. I don't, I don't really use TripAdvisor because I don't like that everyone has an opinion. And that's, but uh, the thing with Verona is it's uh, also host to the biggest wine fair, maybe in the world, in Italy in April, and I have a lot of friends who go there. So I actually, I, I asked a lot of those guys uh, where they were, where they would go during that week of uh, in Italy, and, and they all the places they sent me were closed because in Verona, tradition has it, good restaurants are shut. So I was always. Apparently, apparently, <laughs> it's, you know, the thing it's, is, it's very particular yeah, to Verona. It, but it looked like it anyways when I was browsing through the guide. So I was scrambling for a while, and but I found a, a place, and uh, I'm, we can't tell the listeners now because then there might be people. <laughs> Not until we've booked. <laughs> until you guys have booked. <laughs> Non le femmine!